secretary in my car. Not long ago, I had to make a 200-mile round-trip drive, and I filled an entire cassette with ideas that came to me as I drove along. Quite often, your best ideas, as you probably know, will come while you're covered with soap in the shower. When they do come, simply walk out, dry your hands, and make a note of it. Ideas are like slippery fish. If they're not speared on the point of a pencil, they'll vanish as quickly as they came, back into the incredible and labyrinthine interstices of our minds, there to perhaps disappear forever. Many of these ideas will be wonderful topics for speeches. There'll be wonderful ideas to add interest and zest to your talks. But there will also be exciting and better ways to do what you do for a living, for earning more money, and there are always answers to knotty problems. Problems are things that are looking for solutions. Educating ourselves to become more creative is the best way I know to solve them. Habits tend to reduce the chances of getting good ideas. It's a good idea to deliberately change long-standing habits. If you always go to work at a certain time, start leaving earlier or later. If you're used to following a certain route to work in your car, take a different route. Eat lunch at a different time and place. Try eating by yourself once in a while with your paper and pencil handy to jot down any good ideas that come along. With practice, anyone can become wonderfully creative. Look for creative opportunities hiding in everyday situations. Not long ago in Fort Lauderdale, where I lived, there was quite a storm, high winds and rain. And during the night, the dinghy that was tied to my dock got loose somehow and drifted away. We found it several days later. A friend had seen it floating aimlessly and he'd rescued it for us. The next day, lying by the pool, a wonderful idea came to me. A series of children's stories about a little dinghy that gets blown far to sea in a storm. Then, talking with my 11-year-old son about it, we came up with more than 20 ideas for stories. The dinghy's name is Rinky Dink, and we had it lost in the Sargasso Sea, in the South Pacific, in the Bahamas, at the South Pole. A whole series of children's stories I'm now working on in my spare time, all because of the storm and a lost dinghy. Lurking in every problem, there is a corresponding opportunity. Forming the habit of thinking creatively about problems instead of simply worrying about them can have wonderful and quite profitable results. Creativity is in itself a wonderful subject for a whole series of speeches. How, for example, many of the world's greatest ideas and solutions to problems came to people during moments of leisure. Newton saw the apple fall while resting, and that triggered his discoveries. All happened during a quiet afternoon. Einstein got the theory of relativity while recuperating from a cold in bed. And you and I can get our ideas the most interesting and profitable of our lives during otherwise unproductive times. A great creative idea you get while driving to work can be worth more than 30 years of eight-hour days. And there is nothing, nothing in the world you and I can do that is more important than learning to develop our creative powers. If there's a single best way to make sure our minds are being supplied on a regular basis with the raw materials for creative ideas, it has to be the habit of continuing education. Digging through weekly news magazines is a good source, as well as good books. The more you expose your brains to the excellent brains of others, the more the sparks will fly, the more good ideas you'll get. Your speeches will come alive and sparkle with your newfound source of exciting material. They'll crackle and send off sparks. But more than that, your new creative attitude will enhance every aspect of your life, your personal, business, and professional life. And you'll be learning a way to keep interest and charm in your life for all the years of your life. You know, the late Pearl Buck, the great Nobel Prize winning author, reported that she learned more between the ages of 60 and 70 than she had at any previous period of her life. Her life was a daily adventure. She lived creatively. And you and I and our children can do the same. Start today to look for and write down the ideas that come to you. It may be slow at first. It's like trying to remember your dreams. It takes practice. But it's there, and you can find it with a little daily practice. Thank you.
Let's talk about selling one idea at a time. Professional salespeople, marketing experts, and leaders in the advertising profession know the importance of selling one thing at a time. Only catalogs can successfully handle a multitude of items. In a five-minute speech or even a long speech, I think it's important to have a single theme. And like a good salesman, you pose the problem, then give your solution. At the end, the problem is restated and the solution quickly summarized. Your opening statement should be an attention getter. For example, you might say, scientists all over the world are agreed that the world's oceans are dying. A sobering thought, indeed. It captures immediate interest in everyone's thinking, why that would presage the end of the world. What are we doing about it? Using an internationally recognized authority as your reference, someone such as Jacques Cousteau, you provide the supporting evidence that your opening remark is indeed true, and then you proceed to outline the possible ways that such a disaster might be averted. At the end, you might say, yes, the oceans of the world are dying today, but if we can marshal the combined efforts of the world's peoples, if we can influence every maritime country to pass laws governing the pollution of the sea, oil tankers, so you end on a note of hope and at the same time enlist the sympathy of every one of your listeners in your cause. Recent tests indicate that from 10 to 20 percent of our high school graduates are functionally illiterate. Now that's a stopper. And as with the poison in the sea, you establish credence for your subject and then marshal possible answers. Always on the same subject, restate the problem at the end, and recap the answer. Not all talks are about social problems, of course. You might be talking about a recent fishing trip, in which case you find something of special interest in the story and open with that. You might say, uh, ounce for ounce, the rainbow trout is one of the gamest fish on earth. It's a much better attention getter and interest stimulator than saying, I want to tell you about my recent fishing trip. A few words about the fish you were after and then you can work in the rest. Two weeks ago, John Cooper and I decided to try our luck on the White River near Cotter, Arkansas. It's one of the most naturally beautiful spots in the country and so on. Stay with the trip and that rainbow trout, the hero of your story, and how good it tasted cooked fresh over an open fire on the bank of the river. Then at the close, to more closely link your listeners to the subject, you might say, if you've never been trout fishing, let me recommend it as one of the world's best ways to forget your problems, clear your brains, and gain a new perspective. And when you hook a rainbow trout, you're in for one of the greatest thrills of a lifetime. In my video programs, I try to include the listener in my subject and relate it to him or her and his or her needs. If I'm talking about new ideas on the art of managing a company, I'll say that the same ideas apply to managing a family or one's own life. In that way, no one's left out of the picture, and you've got a much better chance of interesting everyone. Pose the problem if there is one. Give the best possible solution and some good authority for it. Restate the problem in a brief and perhaps dramatic way and summarize the answer. That's the way to have a complete, tidy, well-rounded talk. If there's no problem, find a point of interest and begin with that. What's your personal pronouns? Keep yourself out of your conversation as much as possible. As with the case of the fishing story, talk about the fish, the beautiful scenery, your companions, other people you met, a humorous incident that you perhaps, but don't keep saying, I did this and I did that. The purpose of the speech is not to talk about you, but rather the subject matter. There's an old saying that small minds talk about things, average minds talk about people, and big minds talk about ideas. What you're selling is almost always an idea. Even if it's painting the house, the idea is the good appearance or the protection of the house. The fishing trip story is about the idea of getting away and going after exciting game fish. One idea, well developed, is the key. If you're talking about a long trip you've made, the idea is the trip itself. Even though your talk may include many interesting and unusual events and sights along the way, it's still one theme. Just as a beautiful painting is put together by a thousand brush strokes, each stroke makes a contribution to the main theme, the overall picture. And it's the same with a good speech. The difference, I think, between a memorable speech and an ordinary one is usually the degree of involvement on the part of the speaker. If he's wrapped up in his subject, if he knows what he's talking about and is personally involved in it, that comes through. It's not in the words he uses, it's in the feeling that's transmitted. If you want to test this out, listen to news broadcasts on your radio or watch them on television. The performer who's only reading the news from a script or teleprompter, who has no real knowledge or personal interest in it, tends to be superficial and generally dull. 
the newsman who's been there, who's lived the news, who's made the collection and dissemination of news his life work, brings conviction and interest, involvement, and you and I are caught up in it. We simply know that he knows what he's talking about, while the other person is only reading. It's the same when giving a speech. If the person telling the story about the fishing trip is an avid fisherman and loves it, it comes through. So try to talk about things in which you're very interested and use the single theme formula. It makes preparing a talk much easier and the delivering of it much more effective. Thank you. A very good friend of mine, an outstanding man in many ways and very successful, once found himself in the exquisitely embarrassing position of having his audience stand up and walk out of the hall while he was in the middle of his speech. Every one of them left the room. The exodus was triggered by one man who stood up and voiced the growing resentment of the entire group by shouting at the speaker, Who do you think you're talking to? With that, he stalked from the room and the entire audience followed. My friend found himself standing at the podium, gulping and wondering what had happened. How in the world did such a terrible thing happen? Well, perhaps you've already hit on the answer. My friend underestimated his audience. He was a very successful head of a large company. He was accustomed to talking to his own salespeople, especially those who were young and just starting out. They were green and inexperienced. Moreover, he was the boss, and in that position received their unflagging attention and respect. Not so the group that walked out. They were highly trained professionals, mature and well-educated. Their organization had arranged for my friend to speak to them because of his success and reputation as a business leader. He talked to them as though they were a bunch of children. Without thinking, he began his tirade, as he had done so many times with a room full of new salesmen. They simply wouldn't stand for it. They were offended and outraged. My friend learned a lesson he should not have had to learn. Before you make a speech, think about the group you're going to speak to. Chances are it includes some very successful people. If you're talking to a sales organization, you may be talking to some people who do a lot better than you do and who know more about the subject you've chosen. You can still make a valuable contribution and an excellent and much appreciated speech, but stay humble. Every human being has a genetic strong point. You may be great at what you do and you should be, but remember that other people are great in their ways too and keep a healthy respect for the people you're addressing. I often say something such as, I'm sure there are many people in this audience more qualified to speak on this subject than I, but perhaps we'd all do better with a little reminding from time to time. Will Rogers said that none of us is smart enough to remember all he knows. Such a statement causes people to drop their guard and relax. They think, okay, this guy isn't challenging me, I'll see what he's got to offer. Maybe I'll even pick up an idea. If my successful business man friend had approached his professional group as professional, and indicated that he knew they were seasoned professionals, it would have been a lot better. It would still have been an uninteresting and boring speech, but they may well have put up with it, and he would never have been the wiser. We need to remember that success in one field doesn't qualify us as experts or grant us omniscience in other fields. Quite often when I've been asked to speak to our group, the program chairman has suggested that I talk on a particular subject. I'm quick to tell him that I have the subject I talk about and that that's my main interest and that I don't tailor make speeches for special groups. If he wants me, he gets my subject. It's simply a matter of sticking with what you know, what you're really qualified to talk about. Many times I've received letters and calls from people telling me they want to become speakers. I always ask them, what do you want to talk about? It quite often takes them back. They just want to be speakers. They don't have a subject in which they're deeply involved and interested. And I don't think we need more speakers. We need more informed and dedicated people. I know an economist who heads his department in a large financial oh. institution. Every Friday morning, there's an officer's meeting, and the head of each department is asked to report. My economist friend's report is always wonderfully interesting and often contains some really funny humor. Everyone looks forward to his report each Friday morning, and he's succeeded in turning what might have been a very dull and uninteresting meeting into one of charm and interest. He knows his subject. He's an excellent economist, and he's comfortable oh. and at ease talking about it. He knows his audience, too. He wouldn't make the same speech to reporters asking him to report on the national economy, nor to an economics class in a local college. In each case, the audience must be taken into consideration. 
one of the worst things we can ever do is to talk down to our audience we should stretch them if possible but never make the mistake of assuming they aren't as smart as we are that includes talking to young people in junior achievement 4-h clubs high school kids and so on make them stretch up to your subject if necessary but don't ever be patronizing it offends them deeply and they quickly recognize that you've underestimated them they're a lot smarter than you think we would all rather be overestimated than underestimated i used to have a physics instructor who had attended seminars conducted by the great dr albert einstein he told me that as the distinguished doctor warned to his subject you could see the college professors and instructors in the audience dropping out as he passed beyond their grasp of the subject eventually the doctor was talking to himself while his audience listened in amazement he overestimated their knowledge and understanding and they loved him for it had he talked to them as though they were children they would have deeply resented it so never never ever under any possible circumstances sell your audience short never underestimate their brains nor their ability to grasp what you're talking about before the speech talk to the officers of the organization or the head of the company or organization about the people you'll be speaking before he'll give you a good picture of them and you'll be on much sounder footing it pays to know your audience thank you Kansas by the name of O'Brien. He used to work with Babe Zaharias back in the old days. He knows how to take strokes off your game. And he's written a little book about his method entitled Aim and Hang Loose. In a very inadequate nutshell, Gene O'Brien's system is that our minds and bodies know how to do what we want them to do, most especially if we've had some good training. Instead of trying to concentrate on a dozen different things, the stance, the grip, the straight left arm, the slow comeback, the motionless head, the full turn, there are a dozen more things we could unsuccessfully try to think about in the three seconds it takes to hit a golf ball. Instead, Gene O'Brien says we should stand behind the ball and see where we want to go, where we want the ball to land. Once we have that picture clearly in mind, we can take our stance, aim, and hang loose. Chances are we'll hit a pretty good shot. The same excellent advice works well in many personal experiences in life itself. Aim and hang loose. I know Gene won't mind my using his title. In making a successful talk, we need to do the same kind of thing. Where do we want the ball to go? What is our aiming point? Now let's get that clear in your mind. I've agreed to make a commencement address at the graduation ceremonies of a local high school. I want to convince those young graduates and the other students and parents in the audience that the most important thing we can do in life is become well-educated human beings and that that education is a lifelong process. Yeah. That it doesn't, can and shouldn't end with getting a diploma, which is the old vaccination theory of education. I've been to school, now I don't have to study anymore, is the way many people think about it. Well, when I get through, I would want every person in that hall to fully understand that we're in a race between education and catastrophe in this world, and the best thing we can do to help the situation is to make certain we're not among the dummies that we need to do a lot of reading and have fine home libraries and make certain, if we can, that every day finds us a little smarter than we were the day before. I know my aiming point, and I'll spend 30 minutes swinging at it. I'll be prepared. I'll have my notes, the quotations I want, all the ammunition, corroboration, and proof I need. I accepted that speech because I'm such a nut on the importance of education, and I want to convince those young people the parents may be set in concrete by now, that commencement means the beginning, not the end. Now, just as that system, aim and hang loose, is the key to good golf, it's the key to effective speaking also. If you try to concentrate on your gestures, your stance, your craggy district attorney, wow. work, your emphasis, your ringing diphthongs, your wry smile, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth, you may end by shanking your subject. Hang loose. Be yourself. Forget yourself. Use the best English of which you're capable. Don't think you have to sound like a moron to be thought of as one of the good old boys. 
But aim and hang loose. Keep your mind on the ball, on your aiming point, and work toward it. In my opinion, it's the key to a great speech. All great athletes and performers have that wonderful hang loose quality about them. They're never tense or uptight. It's a kind of controlled relaxation. You see it in a great basketball player as he sings a long shot, and you see it in every sport and great performance. Watch for it and develop it in your own delivery. Will Rogers used to spin or play with a rope while he was talking. Perry Como has been accused of nearly falling asleep, and the new crop of stars have that same wonderful kind of professionalism, controlled relaxation. They aim and hang loose. Getting back to that golf analogy for a minute, it's been established that one of the best ways to correct a bad golf swing is to watch yourself swinging a club. It can be done with videotape or a home movie camera. Quite often, people seeing their golf swing for the first time break out in helpless laughter or uncontrollable crying. Do I look like that, they cry. Similarly, giving your speech at home while a tape player is running is the world's best known way of finding out how you sound to your audience. You're probably familiar with the fact that you don't sound to others as you sound to yourself. You hear yourself speak from inside your head. Others hear it from the outside and the two are quite different. Also, you have no way of realizing how you may be slurring or half pronouncing words until you hear yourself, until you can sit down and critically listen to yourself. One of my pet peeves is the use of the word recognize. Time and again, I hear people saying recognize. There's a letter G in there and it's supposed to be pronounced. Now you don't have to sound like an English professor, but if you want to make speeches, you owe it to your audience to treat the language with care, clarity, and consideration. Another pet peeve of mine is the use of the plural they when the singular he should be used. Let me give you a common example. When you're talking to a customer, the speaker will say, make sure they understand that a customer is singular, they is plural. It should be, when you're talking to a customer, make sure he understands, and so forth. If you deal only with women customers, it would be she. However, if you deal with both men and women, he is proper, or he or she, but never they, unless you're saying, when speaking to a group of customers, make sure they understand. That's all right. Elementary? Yes, but a common and irritating and egregious mistake. If you don't like the idea of speaking good English, don't make speeches. And when you're preparing your talk, remember Gene O'Brien's advice. Aim and hang loose. Thank you. You have accepted an invitation to speak before a National Honor Society meeting of high school students. You set aside a time in which to prepare your talk. You accepted the speech because you felt you had something worth saying to young people. And so you ask yourself, what can I say to these young men and women that will be of help to them? You think of your main theme. Let's say it's the importance of continuing education. The importance of not thinking that school represents the total of our educational efforts. At the same time, you know that these young people have been in the educational system for a long time. They may be tired of the daily grind of the classroom, and perhaps the thought of spending the rest of their lives in the educational process will turn them off. You have to show education itself in a new light, and somehow reveal the joy of discovery that comes from studying in the field of our main interest. We don't mind. In fact, we really enjoy studying in those subjects in which we have a strong interest. All right, you've got the speech going, and then you remember that you will be speaking to high school kids, young adults, really. You want to be sure that your vocabulary is one that will earn their interest and respect without, at the same time, confusing them with words they may not yet understand. In other words, you want to speak to them in their vocabulary, not the slang vocabulary of teenagers by any means. All attempts by an adult to be one of the gang when it comes to young people will end in embarrassment and ridicule. They're not looking for a pal. They're looking for helpful information and a little inspiration, maybe, from a person they can respect and believe. So you use an adult vocabulary. These are people in school. They're familiar with words in the educational process, and you'll be making a serious mistake to attempt to talk down to them. It's better to make them stretch to understand than to have to lean down. Yeah. Any such attempt will be quickly seen as an attempt to be patronizing, and you'll lose your audience. Level with them. 
Speak from your heart and mind, under control, and give them your best. They'll respond wonderfully. Perhaps the following week you have a talk to make at a meeting of people in your particular profession or line of business. The same rule will apply here with the exception that you're free to use the jargon of your calling. And whatever large words are called for, your audience will understand you. And next Sunday you've agreed to take over a Sunday school class of fifth graders, children about 10 years old. You prepare your talk to them at their age level. You speak to them in language they can understand. If you're making a speech to a group of people from another country, they'll be delighted if you will speak to them in their own language. You can do that by writing out your speech in English. Remember to keep it short. Have it translated into the language of the people to whom you'll be speaking, and then with the words written phonetically. If you have trouble with the words in the foreign language, and with a foreign language expert to help you, you learn to read the speech effectively in that language. Yes, it takes a little time. If you don't want to take the time, don't accept the speech. Can you imagine a foreign dignitary coming to this country and making his speech in his own language? I think you will expect him to make the speech in English. You don't mind his accent or his difficulty with certain words or his labored pronunciation. You're delighted that he's speaking to you in your own language. And foreigners feel the same way. It takes years to learn a foreign language properly, perhaps but you can learn to read a short speech in a foreign language over a weekend. I remember reading Philip Wiley's comment that any person can learn how to do a creditable appendectomy in two days. Now that doesn't make him a physician, but one aspect of almost anything can be picked up in a short, concentrated effort. I make it a principle to always arrive for a speech early so that I can talk to the officials of the group. I find out what the people do in their general educational background to make sure they square with what I had believed when I prepared my talk. What's the average age? The idea is to know your audience as well as possible so that you can speak to the people in it in their language. You remember that when Bob Hope made his hundreds of appearances before servicemen and women all over the world, he would go to some pains to pick up some of their vocabulary and the names of some of their officers. In that way, he could personalize his performance to that particular unit. Well, we should do the same without becoming too cute or personal. We just want them to know that we've gone to the trouble to do some research and that we know to yeah. be talking, that we're not just delivering a canned speech without consideration for the people who must sit through it. The speaker who arrives at the last possible moment and is whisked to the stage may be all right for political stumping, but it tends to leave the audience feeling slightly alienated. We used to have a newscaster years ago in the station at which I worked who had dashed for the studio at the last instant, arriving at the microphone out of breath, just as the engineer was cutting on the microphone. Well, the rest of us felt that it was a phony ploy on his part. And so one afternoon, we set the clock in the newsroom five minutes ahead. When our histrionic newscaster began his last minute dash for the studio, he found the door to the newsroom had been locked and he couldn't get out. As his newsroom clock ticked, and indicated that it was time to be on the air, my voice came over his speaker, introducing him. Then, silence. Then I came in again and apologized to the listening audience, telling them that I couldn't imagine where John was, and we stalled around like that for two or three minutes, while he pounded on the newsroom door and screamed to be let out. We let him out in time for his newscast.